Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Clinical Trials Guru. I'm here with my partner, Dan. And today we have the pleasure of having Darshan Cole Carney online. Um, Darshan, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you, Don? How I'm are you, Dan? I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good. Darshan is a, a gentleman who is he's an attorney, a pharmacist as well. Am I correct? Correct. I don't know when you had time to do all that. That's a lot of <laughs> studying. Uh, he's also a, a college professor, mm -hmm. lecturer. Associate professor, yeah. Uh -huh. and, and he's been a consultant or still is a consultant for the FDA? No, no. I, um, I do FDA regulatory work and ah, okay. I work in compliance. Okay, so I stand corrected. Things then. like HHS and uh, Department of Justice type of compliance work. All right. For our listeners today and for a couple of people that have sent Dan a few um, questions, we're going to address those with uh, Darshan today. And Dan, what are those questions that you have? Yes, indeed. And we have Darshan on regularly. And so I've asked people to send in their questions and they have. Um, so I, I'm going to pick out a few of those today. And, you know, the other ones, don't worry, we'll get to those two. We'll probably do like mini videos. We try to find the questions that would appeal to the broader audience. There's some very specific questions we got, which, you know, we can get into later on. But the the two that I thought were really good are the ones I'm going to ask you, Darshan, mm -hmm. if that's okay with you. Sure. Okay, so the first one is from an individual in Bulgaria. It's a female out there. She works at a, as a project assistant for a CRO. Mm -hmm. And she wants to know, first of all, she has like two questions. She wants to know where she can find some, any kind of documents, either online or offline, uh, that explain the informed consent process. And then she wants to know what an informed consent process should be like. So if you can kind of walk us through maybe those two questions. Yeah, and, and before we get started, uh, just to let you know, any information coming from Darshan, this is, he's not giving any legal advice. This is just a conversation that we're having, just like if we were to meet on the streets and said hello and we just got to talking. So there's nothing here. This, none of this is legal advice, just to let you know before we start. Thank you, Don. You're welcome. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, so, so the question that you started off with is where can I get information for informed consent forms? And I guess the, sec the second question you had was um, what is the process? What does the process actually involve? Um, actually, there are tons of resources online, as you guys have undoubtedly noticed. Uh, there, the, the most recent and um, valuable one I'm starting to find is, um, I'm, I'm forgetting their name, but it's basically a collaboration with Duke University. And um, it's basically an, an industry, uh, university, uh, government type of uh, collaboration where they put out a whole bunch of documents. Um, including, um, my recollection is, informed consent forms um, that you might be able to use as a jump-off point. Um, do you, are you guys off the top of your head? Can you guys remember what the name is? I'm sure I could get that to you. Wasn't it, it like uh, something with Cambridge? Or was that not it the one? It starts with a C. I, don't, I think I'm thinking of something else. But I'm sure I can get the name for your, your viewers pretty soon. Um, but uh, that, that would probably be the place I would start off with. Um, there are a simple Google search will bring a bunch of um, informed consent resources for you. The other place to look at, quite honestly, is just the FDA's website um, because the, it, it outlines the needs and requirements of what informed consent form should consist of. Um, there are guidances out there. There are regulations that actually talk about it. Um, but you know what? It, that's all the legal answer to this, and, and that's from the practical level what is it that you need to do and what is the informed consent process? Um, I'm not aware of Bulgarian law, but I would imagine um, Bulgarian law has the same basic guidances and basic principles as most other laws globally, which is they want to protect consumers and patients. Mm -hmm. um, informed consent is basically a way of doing that. Uh, informed consent came out of a lot of the... Um, a lot of the issues that we had over the last century mm -hmm. um, where you, you had issues like Nuremberg and you had issues like um, uh, the Belmont uh, issues that, that came to light. Um, 
you, I'm sure you guys have heard of the Declaration of Helsinki, and you guys yes. have heard of um, right. the Belmont Principles. They all came out of basically these ideas that individuals who participate in clinical trials should know that they're participating in those, in those clinical trials. They should understand what's going to happen to them. They should have the right to say no. Um, they should know what are their responsibilities. They should know what are their rights. And, and that's what an informed consent does. It's supposed to tell them, here's what we know. Here's what, is going, it, here's what we expect will happen to you. Here's what we know um, has happened to other people in the past. Um, and we would like to see if this, if this works. You don't want to call it a drug because at this moment it's not been approved. You don't want to call the person a patient because you aren't treating them. You're, these are subjects, and they have to recognize that they may not be getting treated. And that's sort of a very critical and important mm-hmm. thing to recognize when, uh, when you're doing this. Um, and, and an informed consent form should ideally talk about each of these elements. They should talk about the fact that when you come into a clinical trial, you aren't coming in there because you're getting the latest and greatest treatment. What you're actually coming in there is to see if this works. So, uh, so an informed consent form has multiple elements. So I believe, if I remember correctly, there are like 10 elements to an informed consent form that must be there. Um, one of them actually now, they added a new one recently that you guys may be aware of. Um, it came from the, um, I mean, there are several laws and stuff that came into it, but a lot of it was generated out of the Henrietta Lacks issue. Do you guys know what mm-hmm. that is? Yeah, that was the one that uh, was the uh, university, not the university, but uh can't think of the hospital back east. It has something to do with cancer cells that Hopkins. was taken. Yeah, John yeah. Hopkins, actually. John Hopkins, yeah. John Hopkins. Yeah. Um, I'm going to blame it on age. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, well, it's exactly right. The issue was uh, they took some uh, cells from her, and uh, HeLa cells, and they basically used them over and over and over again. They've made millions off of it. And the family of Henrietta Lacks never saw the money. Um, the the issue is who owns those rights? Who's, whose um, cells are these? Are, do they belong to the person who, from whom they were taken? Or do they belong to um, the person who, who took them and saved them and used them and uh, populated them? Um, and these are all rights that in, in a true informed consent form that you guys are probably now starting mm-hmm. to see, there are elements in there saying that this information belongs to me or this information belongs to you. We're only using it or whatever licensing uh, issue that you may have. Um, but informed consent, again, that's what an informed consent form is. A lot of people make the mistake, um, in my experience, of, uh, of saying that, oh, if, as long as I get the informed consent form signed, everything's good. And, and that's often a critical mistake. An informed consent form is just a type of proof that something happened. What, what's more important is that the something happens. Mm. So um, you, you, and the, something that happens has to be um, you actually have a conversation with the person. You explain to them what are the risks of participating in the clinical trial, what are the benefits mm-hmm. of participating in the clinical trial. Um, and that person has to understand what those risks are. Uh, in certain cultures, uh, it's it's normal. I mean, in the U.S. culture, for example, we'd like to we like to talk about how it's important that um, that an individual's right to privacy be maintained, and that um, if they're participating in the clinical trial, we we make sure that all the information that we have about them is protected. Um, and that's that's true globally to a certain extent. But in a lot of other countries, you'll actually see people saying, I want to have my family members there. I'm not thinking clearly. I want someone who has my best interest at heart to come into the room with me and understand what you're saying. And, and when, you, when I understand what you're saying, I want that person to have the right to, say, to talk to me and explain to me what I missed and right. then have that conversation with you. Right. So, so again, there's a cultural element to this. And again, that'll be specific for Bulgaria, depending on what she's doing. But... Um, but there's an element off that and recognize that, um, that what you're doing in the end is just explaining to the person what's going to happen to them. Um, does that sort of answer your question? Dan? Yeah, does. so it kind of leads to like her second question, and I guess a lot of the viewers out there, which is why I chose this question to ask you, is mm-hmm. as a lawyer, you know, as an attorney, and again, this is not legal advice, okay? This <laughs> is pure entertainment for all you viewers out there. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
because it's very entertaining stuff, Darshan. Um, <laughs> what would be an FDA audit proof informed consent process? Like, take us through when the subject walks in the office doors to when he's finished his screening visit. You know, I'm sure you'll miss some things because we didn't actually prepare you for this question, but just just give us like the most important things for that informed consent process. And and you've already e- explained a few of those already. Yeah. Um, again, this is just sort of off the top of my head without doing right. a significant research in the area. But um, you, you first of all have to understand what type of what type of trial are you running? So, for example, in certain cases, you can't get informed consent. So, for example, you're talking about a traumatic incident. You're talking about, say, uh, blood products that have to be given immediately. Uh, you're talking about someone who came in with a stroke. It's really difficult to get consent at those times. So the first question is, are we talking about that type of study? If but you're not, if, uh, if you're talking about a study where um, informed consent isn't possible, sometimes you actually have to take other steps previously prior to the study even starting to get a, I, I don't know if you guys have read those guidances or even had the opportunity to work on those types of studies, but in those situations, you actually have to go into the society and say, here's something we want to do in your society, in your community. Are you guys okay with this? You give, you give the community an opportunity to basically accept informed consent on behalf of individuals because that individual themselves may not be able to give, uh, to give informed consent. For example, um, again, you might have a gunshot wound. A guy comes in shot. He's the only person there. You don't know anything that's happening. Mm-hmm. And let's say I'm making this up. Let's say we're talking about a, a new type of blood. In the sense, it's, it's a synthetic type of blood. Because I know that there were, uh, that might be a type of uh, urgent situation that might need this. In that situation, you can't ask them, can I test a new type of blood on you? <laughs> so what you might do is you might reach out to the community and say, we want to do this clinical trial. Here are the risks. Here are the benefits. Uh, talk to the FDA. Explain to them what you want to do. Talk to the IRB. Um, and then sort of have a process and a process in place saying, here's what we're going to do. Assuming you aren't dealing with that type of study, the next thing you're sort of looking at is someone who is aware of, um, of what, what's going to happen to them. Again, there are three types, or at least three types of people who are not aware. Um, someone who is, um, is challenged in some way, whether it's mentally challenged or just doesn't have the capacity yet, so someone like a child, um, or uh, someone who may be under duress. So um, someone comes in and says, I have no money. Can I participate in any clinical trial? Because if I uh, participate in the clinical trial, I'll get some treatment and I might get some money out of it as well. So right. then you have to start questioning yourself. How are you choosing your subjects? Are you mm-hmm. okay with that subject being in there? Um, and those are ethical and legal questions you have to weigh as this person walks in. Um, if you're talking about someone who doesn't have the capacity to agree you need to make sure you actually get the right type of informed consent, uh, not only from the person. So if, if it's a child, depending on the age of the child, you may be able to, um, to have a conversation with them and, and say, here's what we think we want to do. Are you okay with it? But even if they say it's okay, you may not be able to do it. So let's say we're talking about a 12-year-old or a mm-hmm. 13-year-old. They may be able to understand your words, but they may not be able to understand the implications of it. So in those situations, you may need to sort of reach out to a parent uh, or a guardian. Uh, in the other hand, you may be talking. On the other hand, you may be talking about um, um, we, we we may be talking to people who are just mentally don't have the capacity to do it. And again, you need to look out for a guardian uh, in those situations. They, the guardians may be institutions. They may they may be individuals. Um, each of these ob- obviously plays a role. In, um, in deciding how that informed consent, consent is going to go on. The next step is uh, who's going to do the informed consent? Are, is, the invest, is the PI going to do it? Are you going to have someone who is not a PI but is, um, say, an RN? Or are you going to have someone who's neither PI or, nor an RN? Uh, or do you sort of just say, I'm going to give you a piece of paper, read it, and, and sign it? Right. Um, you surprised how often that actually happens. Is that acceptable uh, again, in of... any case, or is that not uh, the best way? Well, obviously, it's not the best way to go about it, but is it legal? Uh... Again, it, it depends. 
in the end, the idea is to, is to see if the person understood the risks and benefits in participating in that clinical trial. Okay. Handing someone a piece of paper, how are you going to prove that they understood the risks and benefits? Um, it's, a, it's a more difficult argument. Um, on the other hand, um, it, it's sort of like, say, um, me going in right now and, and trying to give informed consent um, about a type of surgery. I have no basis to give informed consent about a type of surgery because I don't know enough about it. So, um, so someone's got to explain that process to me. Um, so then, then it, it, you, you start going down the, the list of types of people who can actually do the informed consent. You talk about a, um, an individual who isn't, uh, who, who isn't qualified. Uh, maybe, maybe they are qualified based on training, but maybe they aren't qualified based on um, their education. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, how, how, are you, how are you going to prove that they have the requisite training? On the other hand, you decide to go with an RN. Do they have just the degree, or do they actually understand what's going to happen to them? Do they, you then go with a sub-I. Is it, does the sub-I understand what's in store? Uh, are they actually participating in this clinical trial, or are they sort of just a, they just happen to be there and don't really know what the protocol actually involves? Mm-hmm. Or you actually have the PI who's read the study, who understands what's going on, and is going to be available to actually talk about it. Um, some people decide to use a, a piece piecemeal approach so they will probably give the they, they might give the piece of paper tell them read it then come in explain what the piece of paper says and then the pi comes and actually says do you have any questions there are different ways of handling it none of them more right than the other um it, it's really just a question of understanding some some sites even say things like here's the document go home read it come back in two days uh you've had once you've had a chance to read it and understand it uh, I am here to answer any questions you have, but I want you to have the opportunity to understand what you're getting into. So those those are all potential ways. Um, then the next thing is getting that document signed, making sure when when do you do this? Do you do this um, at the time of the screening process, or do you do this uh, at the before the first uh, before you start the study? And the question really is, please do it before you do anything to the person. Um, you'd be surprised how often you get informed consent forms signed after um, the study basically started. And someone goes, oh, whoops, we forgot everything. We, we need to get some documents signed. Here's, here's an informed consent form signed four days after the first dose was given. <laughs> and you're going, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Right. Um, obviously, mistakes happen. Obviously, things happen, and the FDA recognizes it. The question really is, is this a issue of... Um, a process breaking down, or is this an issue of a person who needs to be retrained, or is this a per- is this an issue of the site just doesn't have any processes in place and they're sort of flying by the seat of their pants? Each of which would may have a different repercussion. And that would. Be, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that no, sounds like, and that sounds like that's something that the site monitor should be looking for as well. Am I correct? Of course. Yeah. Um, I mean, and the site monitor may, may very well be the first person to catch it. Um, but you all, you often have sites that are new and sites who haven't done clinical trials before. As you know, a lot of clinical trials, uh, I believe it's what, 3% of all physicians participate in clinical trials, of which 2% leave at the end of each year. <laughs> I think those are the numbers I've heard. Yeah, I think you did that story once, Don. On the... Yeah, we talked about that, yeah. Yeah, so um, you have a consistent turnover of physicians who want to be part of it because you're finally getting paid as opposed to a lot of Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement where that's problematic. Uh, but then they find out that it's not all that they thought it would be, whether it's <laughs> um, delayed reimbursement, yeah. whether it's uh, whether it's whatever. Um, the, the issue ends up being they just don't want to be part of it, um, in which case they either don't have the right processes in place, they don't have the right training in place, or mm-hmm. they just didn't know what they're getting into. Um, so So then you sort of, going back again, you would start off by the monitor having had a chance to... So, so this is, again, what we should be doing as a site first. And then there, is, there are multiple levels and layers of security on top of it, whether it's the IRB actually reviewing the document to make sure that it's appropriate. I don't know if you saw a recent uh, news, news release where, I forget which, which IRB it was, but it just got banned from approving any more studies right now. Well, um, I haven't seen that. You, you don't hear about that. There was I'm a sure few in the past. Yeah, that's uh, that's always happening. I know a few years ago the Coast IRB, 
was the one that was mm-hmm. completely shut down because the FDA had a, a sting operation yeah. on them. They were that just one rubber was, stamping. Was pretty blatant. Yeah, they were yeah. just rubber stamping protocols. And the funny thing, we're totally getting off topic, but the funny thing is that Coast IRB, we were using them for a lot of our studies, but they were they had all these protocols. They were just rubber stamping wow. it without looking at the safety. Wow. And the the funny thing though or a kind of sad thing is that all these business magazines were featuring them as like one of the fastest growing companies and it's unusual cuz it's an IRB you don't expect those to be on those kind of lists and you know but myself being interested in business I would be reading all these articles I said wow <laughs> Coast IRB they're you know this is an amazing organization next thing you know right. they get shut down cuz of the sting operation yeah right um, and that's actually part of the problem. The FDA, as you guys know, has taken more of a risk-based approach to to audits. Are you guys aware of this or no? Yes, that that was okay. actually one of the things that I was going to bring up because that's something that Patrick brought up as well when we interviewed mm-hmm. him is that they are taking more of that uh, risk-based uh, approach. But I wanted to take you back to uh, one of the subjects that you hit on and you put emphasis on mm-hmm. when you were sharing with us the structure, how to structure a uh, consent form, informed consent. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, that, and I hear this from some clinicians, and I think even clinicians truly do not have an understanding of, of what they're doing when it comes to um, clinical studies, and that's the difference between someone coming in as a patient or someone coming in as a subject. Mm -hmm. And so many clinicians get it confused because in that particular protocol, they may have to write a script. Mm -hmm. Or if a patient has an adverse event, they may have Mm -hmm. to send them to the hospital. And at that time, they feel like they're treating that patient because those are some of the things they do in their common practice. But the way my understanding is, is that as, as long as you're within protocol, you're still providing a service to that subject. You're not treating that patient. Am I correct? Um, I'm trying to understand the question yet, to be honest, Don. Um, the, are you saying, give me, a, give me a scenario. I think that might help me a little yeah, bit Yeah, and that's what I thought it did. Uh, the, sometimes the physicians are confused on the difference between whether or not they're treating a patient that's in a clinical study right. Right. or if, if the person is still a subject. Some thinks that as long as they're writing scripts oh, okay, or uh, medic- so, medical scripts. So your, your issue tends to be tied around as the issue of medical scripts and their relationship to whether a, that it automatically creates a doctor-patient relationship? Correct. And that's what some physicians, I think, get confused. They think right. they believe now that if they have to do these things, then they're no longer mm-hmm. providing that service for a subject. They're now treating a patient. So there, as, as you know, there are some physicians' offices who also do clinical trials. Mm-hmm. So, in fact, that's one of the reasons they're chosen to be part of the clinical trials because right. they actually have a pool of patients who may actually be who may actually benefit and may able, may, may be able to further uh, science by being part of those studies. Yeah, shameless um, plug, South Coast Clinical Trial. That's why we're selected for a lot of studies, uh, believe it or not. Okay. Just throw um, that in there. <laughs> no, that was good. I, I I didn't know whether you guys were a site uh, or you guys were a both a physician's office and a site. Um, yeah, I, I, you did put in the shameless plugs. They're good for you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> but, thank you. <laughs> great lead-in, by the way. Uh, my my recommendation there would be um, when you have a physician, they they do actually have a patient physician relationship as well. So that's not to say just because you become a, a researcher, you're automatically not a you don't have a physician patient relationship. What you have to recognize is now you have two relationships, mm-hmm. and you have to recognize in which capacity you're acting. Mm-hmm. Um, in in both capacities you have to have the, the patient or the subject's best interest at heart, mm-hmm. right? So if at any point during a clinical study you feel like that person is not, is in danger or is, in, is being harmed, it's your responsibility to stop that person from being part of that study any longer. Mm-hmm. Right. On the other hand, um, so, so that is the prerogative of the investigator, that's the right of the investigator, that's the duty of the investigator. On the other hand, uh, as a physician, uh, you may be writing scripts and um, 
and that may be perfectly appropriate, but you have to recognize that, that there's an impact on the study, especially when you talk about things like washout periods, um, which may require that the patient not get certain drugs during that time, any or certain drugs during that time. So um, if you're both the physician and the researcher, you, you, have, a better, you have better control over what's happening and whether uh, both the study's integrity is being maintained and the, uh, and the a person is um, either being treated, treated as a patient or a subject. Um, on the other hand, you have certain situations, as, as we just discussed, where the site is only a site and it doesn't actually engage in any type of treatment practices. Mm -hmm. In that case, the relationship is a lot clearer. In that case, it's just a site, uh, a researcher to a subject relationship. Okay. Right. And uh, obviously, the, the duty to protect the interests of the subject remain. However, the duty to treat doesn't exist there. Okay. Right. And, I just have to recognize that there is a dichotomy in relationships. There's a dichotomy in responsibilities, uh, um, and, and and those. I, I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, you're you're point, answering but... it very good. I appreciate it. Exceptional breakdown of these uh, questions. You guys, <laughs> you guys are so lucky out there watching. We should be charging you for this, <laughs> but it's absolutely free. Darshan, that was great. Uh, I want to get into another question, okay? Because we're running uh -huh. out of time here. Um, a guy in India reached out to me. I guess he is a he works for an SMO or it's a new SMO that hasn't been established yet. But he's in charge of uh coming up with SOP. And I guess mm -hmm. I don't know if he's coming up with a business plan. Um well, actually he says it is a business plan, but he also needs to make um a report for his boss on how he will establish the new SMO. And that's kind of his question. He wants to know if there's any legal things he's got to look at. Obviously, there's tons. Um, right. But what would you say is the most important things he should start with? And let me just throw this in there again before <laughs> before you start. This is not legal advice. Please understand that. Yes, Vikas Turi, this is free information for your entertainment only. <laughs> Thank you. <You're> right. <laughs> um, the the person recognizes, first of all, I'm not barred in India. I don't know Indian law that well. Okay. Uh, I know there are certain elements to it. Uh, the reason I think that's critical is to recognize that there are certain ownership issues that come up. Um, so the first question he has to ask is, who's who's owning his company? It's, it may be as simple as that. Is it a foreign CRO? Is it establishing a Indian CRO and a SMO subsidiary in which if there are certain ownership criteria that come into play under Indian law. Um, on the other hand, assuming it's a straight-up Indian organization, what types of studies are they going, going to be doing? Because mm -hmm. um, are, are they going to be doing phase one versus phase two versus phase three studies? And the reason that's right. different is, again, under Indian law, um, I, and again, shameless plug for me at this point, I'm making money off of it, um, I actually wrote a book uh, well, a chapter for a textbook. There's a book called Principles and Practice of Pharmaceutical Medicine. Um, and uh, the book on India, I, the chapter on India, I actually wrote it. So um, I have a little bit of experience with um, Indian law as it particularly pertains to the pharma industry. Um, so, but again, that's about a year and a half to two years old. Um, the, I, and I have kept in touch because I have some clients who CRO work in India. Um, but again, to, to take a step back, recognize what your ownership structure is. And the next thing to recognize is what type of SMO are you? Because right. as you guys know, undoubtedly, there are a ton of different versions of SMOs that are out there. Some, co some companies just sort of see them as uh, we're just going to be a loose affiliation of a bunch of doctor sites. A bunch of sites. Now, there's Sean, uh, sorry to interrupt, but just yeah. for our audience out there who may not know what an SMO is, can you kind of give an easy right. explanation? Of course. Um, SMO is short for site management organization. So typically there are, f there are four levels that we should all recognize um, in terms of um, how a clinical trial gets organized. You will have the sponsor, who is the person or the company who wants to do this clinical trial. There will be what's referred to as a CRO or a clinical research organization or contract research organization. And what these people do is um, they are in the business of conducting clinical trials. 
So uh, they will go to a sponsor and say, we will do the study for you. You just give us the money and we'll handle a lot of it from there. Um, what the CRO is responsible for is finding the, the sites that they're going to do these studies with, uh, decide, depending on, again, the relationship between the CRO and the sponsor, whether they'll be handling the budgeting, uh, whether they decide the protocol itself, whether they execute on the protocol, whether they monitor the study, uh, and, and all of those issues. So basically, the CRO represents the sponsor in a certain capacity, depending, again, to the extent that relationship is set up. Typically, CROs may go define, I'm making this up, but say 50 different sites to do the study for them. The issue you often have is it takes a lot of time, effort, and energy to do to find these sites. And what are sites? Sites are, like the South Coast Clinical Trials, one of the places where doctors will actually do these studies for the pharmaceutical company via the CRO. Um, so we've got the doctor's offices or the hospitals, which would be the sites, You've got the CROs, which would be the people who actually do the study. Uh, sorry, who, who actually manage the study, if you will, and the sponsors right. who um, want the study done and pay for this. Now, there, there used to be an efficiency that came about probably about, uh, um, about 15 years ago or so called SMOs. And what they said was, you've got these CROs who are looking at the best interests of, um, of the sponsors, However, the situation is that we're doctors. We, we do, we're clinicians. We aren't in the business of managing business. So what we want to do is avoid this duplication of time and energy, and we'll, we'll create a type of uh, organization where one set or central body will do the negotiations for us, which will do the contracting for us, which will do the marketing for us. Um, and that organization uh, represented in some senses uh, and to the extent necessary, the the, the meet it. So um, they might represent, say, ten sites. So the advantage of an SMO was that um, they added efficiencies to the process by providing a one-stop shop for a lot of the CROs. So if a CRO was looking for, say, fifty uh, fifty sites, they might be able to find fifteen of them or ten of them by going to a single location, which would be the SMO. Um, unfortunately. Um, the, the 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 trend of SMOs died out a few years later. And the reason it died out is uh, they found out that the efficiencies that were supposed to be created never actually existed. You, what you found out was that the SMOs would often add just a add-on amount of money to the process. Mm. And the efficiencies that were supposed to come out never actually arrived. So the doctors still got paid exactly what they got paid. They often ha- got involved in individual negotiations only because... Um, again, it's their choice and their their issue we're dealing with, um, and and yet the the SMO would often ask for ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty percent um, uptick uh, profits just because they were that was their administrative cost or and profits that are off. Um, so the SMO trend sort of died out a few years ago. Slight resurgence in that globally now. Um, I I don't know what this new version will will look like. Some people argue that they found a way of making it more efficient all over, and that may very well. Again, the, the potential for efficiency always existed. It's really been part of the execution. Um, so, so that was sort of the SMO angle. Did that make sense? Yes. Yes, yes it did. It explains it very well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, again, just sort of recapping their fourth four levels. There's the sponsor, there's the CRO, there's the SMO, and then the site. Um, now going back to talking about the SOP for the, for the new SMO, it again depends on what is your relationship going to be with the various sites. Are you in charge of marketing? Are you in char- in, in which case, what are you allowed to say? What are you allowed to represent mm. about these individual um, sites? Um, are you in charge of negotiations? In which case, are you? You have to worry about whether you're giving legal advice, or you're just sort of doing uh, more of a budgeting type function, uh, or are you sort of just giving a? I'm going to negotiate the, the the contract. I'm a businessman. I sort of know what I should be looking out for. If I need more specific information, I'll reach out to a lawyer. That might be one angle some people take. Um, but again, you have to recognize each person sort of brings their own skill sets to it, and you recognize what those skill sets are, and you go from there. 
um, or are you sort of going to be um, organizing how those and are you going to be organizing how the clinical process is going to take place? And and the question you this becomes important because you may suddenly, depending on the responsibilities you take on, become subject to the FDA's audit processes. So is is the FDA going to come to you to look at what your processes are in which you need to have those processes in place? Um, it's really difficult to say here are SOPs for the new SMO because we don't know what you're trying to set up yet. Mm-hmm. You don't know what you're trying to set up yet if you're that new in organization. Right. Um, it, it, as you guys know, it takes about three years before you know exactly what what you're going to be doing uh, in your organization because there are growing pains involved and things that you thought would work don't work. You, you shift your marketing plan. You shift your organization plan. Um, and your, S- your, your SOPs will change with all of them. Mm-hmm. You might start off being a general SMO and then say, I don't want to be a general SMO. I just want to be a focused SMO on these types of studies. Um, but, yes, yeah, so, so that's sort of uh, – it's difficult to say here are a set of SOPs you should be looking at. There are obviously a set of general ideas and principles you should sort of be covering, but how you cover them will be on an SOP by SOP basis there isn't a checklist of oh have we done this and let we're fine we move on from there mm-hmm. uh it's it's more of have we covered all the different issues and if we haven't how do we have do we even have an sop to write sops and it's from there and you and you go from there does that sort of address uh that? yeah i mean v- the question was sent by uh vikas turi from india and i guess if we if you were to answer that any better you would want to a share of the company. So it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, sufficient, Darshan. Thank you yeah. very much. It's excellent sure. stuff. Um, and we love getting these questions in all seriousness because we know that if somebody's asking it, it means that probably a lot of people are, are in the same situation but haven't got a chance to ask anyone. No. And we like picking your brain, Darshan. Oh, fantastic stuff here. <laughs> yeah. I love getting my brain picked as well. So I appreciate okay, you having me on, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to coming on again whenever you guys have some more time. We'll do much more of these. Your oh, regular, absolutely. your regular guest guru of the show, and we'd like to end. <laughs> well, Don, did you have anything left to add? Or well, if I did, we'll be here for another three or four hours. That's right. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to save that for the other interviews. Oh, uh, Darshan's a I'm... regular guest, so please send in your questions, and we'll get them answered. Uh, you know, we'll 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 ask Darshan. And again, it's just for your entertainment. It's not legal advice. Um, we'd like to end by thanking our producers of the show. So we have this thing on our site where research clinics or industry professionals can register their profiles. It costs $99 a year. You get the first 100 sites to do this, get free producer credit for all of our shows. That means that you helped produce the shows because you did. Um, even if it's gas money for me to get to the studio, <laughs> you're helping out in a major way. Damn, Believe you're, me, you're gas is like 420 <laughs> a gallon. I mean, we need more producers. So <laughs> we'd like to quickly thank Sarah Siegler. That and our buddy Sarah. Yeah, she's a producer and Resolve Research Solutions from Ontario, Canada, which, by the way, well, speaking of SMOs, I think they are one. So thank you, guys. <laughs> for producing our shows and we want more of you guys to sign up gas is very costly uh, um <laughs> are you guys i have one more thing that i want to add just so you guys sure, know go ahead. i i found the site that i was referring to when we were talking earlier about informed consent okay. it's called the clinical trials network oh, okay and okay. uh i'm sure yeah. you guys have seen the those guys before there's some documentation yeah. they have a flow chart up there i will email uh, that her might be that um well. i'll email the user the viewer that link and um, when i sent her this video thank you Clinical i appreciate trial it. network yes i've heard uh, yeah they're they've been around for a while oh yeah i i thought this was a collaboration but maybe i'm i'm thinking of someone else but no i think that yeah you know what they do say that it's it's got duke uh, clinical medicine in there and everyone else uh, so okay. it, it is a collaboration so that should be pretty good yeah duke's got their hands in a lot of things but darshan <laughs> Thank you very much. You're Thank going you to be a regular much. contributor to the show. We appreciate it. And gosh, I can't believe this stuff is free for you guys. This is awesome. So thank you, Darshan, for coming <laughs> thank on. Thank you, guys. You're um, it is Dan and Don signing off from theclinicaltrialsguru.com.
Take care. Bye-bye.